welcome uh, to another lecture of this course mathematics for economics part 1. So, in the last lecture we have covered a topic called uh, optimization with a single variable. We are going to start with a new topic today uh, it is integration. Now, uh, integration as we shall see uh, it is the opposite of differentiation that we have discussed earlier and like differentiation integration also is a very important tool uh, of economists and people associated with uh, financial uh, analysis. So, today we are going to start with this new topic introduce a few definitions and concepts and then we shall see what we can say about the applications. Okay, as this is the first slide uh, you can see on your screen and first we are going to interpret uh, integration as area under a curve. So, that is going to be the interpretation of what we mean by integration area under a curve. Okay, so, this is the first question that we are starting with how to estimate the area on a plane which is not enclosed by straight lines on all sides. Right? This is a very old problem the Greek mathematicians dealt with this problem. So, you can understand it is a very ancient problem that has been challenging human mind. If you have an area which is enclosed by straight lines okay, like this it is relatively easy to say something about the area enclosed by these straight lines. But if you do not have straight lines on all sides then it becomes a little bit difficult how to uh, you know estimate the area uh, enclosed by those lines and there are practical implications of finding the area which uh, uh, is enclosed by lines may be straight may be non straight uh, think about surveying the land right uh, different farmers might be having different plots of land and those boundary lines may be straight lines may not be straight lines, but as a surveyor you might be interested to find out what are the areas that are owned by different farmers. Not only farmers every um, landowner irrespective of being farmer or not a farmer uh, might be having uh, lands and the administrators might be interested to find out the areas owned by different uh, landowners. Why? One reason could be the land taxes are imposed on area of the land under your ownership. So, as a surveyor, as an administrator, you will be interested to know uh, the area of land owned by different landowners. So, this uh, question of uh, finding the area enclosed by uh, different lines has a very important practical implications and that is why uh, you know the ancient uh, thinkers were grappling with this problem. Okay, here is the diagram that I have on the screen you can say see that I have a curve f x okay, and I have taken two points on the x axis A and B right. Now, from point A one can find out what is f of A, this is f of A and this will be f of B. Okay. So, uh, in essence you have one side here, one side here and one side here all these three are straight lines but on the top you do not have a straight line you have the curve and this curve can take any shape right. Only thing we need 
is that this y is equal to f x curve or this function it is positive valued right we are on the we are on the first quadrant so f x is positive valued it is continuous right it is a continuous function uh, otherwise there will be gaps and there will not be a continuous line which will be enclosing an area there will be no enclosure if you do not have a continuous line ok. So, the question that we are asking is this given two points a and b on the x axis what is the area between a and b and below the curve. So, this and this below the curve between a and b this entire area we may be interested to find out this area ok. So, that is the question that we are starting with and as we shall see integration actually is a tool which will uh, give us an answer to this question the area between two points and below a particular graph. Okay, let us start with an assumption. The assumption is that let us suppose this area is given by capital A okay. and let us define a function which measures the areas under the graph of y is equal to f x as follows. So, if you have a function y is equal to f x and this is the x axis and let us suppose this is uh, your a this is b and this is x axis right. You are defining something called a x what is a x area under f x between a this point and x x is any arbitrary point and this x is uh, less than b right suppose x is here. So, this area let me shade this area to demarcate it this shaded area we are calling it as a of x ok. So, that is what I have written here a of x is the area under f x between a right a is one point and x x is another point and obviously x is greater than a. Now, from this definition of this area a of x obviously you take the two end points if you take capital A of small a that is you find out what is the area between small a and small a right between small a and a, small a there is no area it is 0 ok uh, that is one uh, extreme the other extreme is capital A of the end point here b ok. So, a of b will be equal to a what is a a mind you was the area. So, the complete area was defined as a capital A. So, pardon the symbols that I have used there are repetition of the same letter uh, right. So, just to uh, clarify between small a and small b the area under the curve is given by capital A right and that is why if I take this function a. So, capital A x is a function if I take capital A of b then I get the entire area and that is equal to capital A. All right, so, these are the uh, boundary uh, points. Since f x is positive right f x is positive that is we are in the first quadrant it is a positive valued as x increases this function also increases the area that we are talking about 
as you are moving to the right you are raising the x and since the function is positive valued so the area under the function will rise and therefore capital a x increases so that is one important property okay we have defined a function uh, so sum total of this is that we have defined a function capital a of x which basically um, measures the end area under this particular function f x between small a and small x. Okay. Now, we are going to play around with this function capital A of x. Uh, let delta x be the change in the value of x. Then the change in the function is given by delta a. Okay. Delta a will be the change in the area uh, and that is given by the new area which is a of x plus delta x minus the old area which is uh, a of x. So, what we are talking about is this uh, extra area delta a. Okay. Just to clarify, we started with this x point and we know a of x is this area, right. Let us use a different shade. This is a of x, all right. Now, suppose x rises, x rises by how much? By delta x. So, the new value of x is this much, x plus delta x, all right. Uh, and the new value of the function is how much functions means the a function it will be a of x plus delta x uh, you know this shaded area plus this shaded area right that will be capital a of x plus delta x okay because this is the new value uh, of the independent variable now we want to find out what is this area this delta a area that is the increment in the area so, that is delta A and that is given by this uh, expression capital A of x plus delta x minus capital A of x, right. That is simple. You are taking the whole and then subtracting the left hand uh, side uh, shaded region, right. And then you are going to get this uh, slanted shaded region, which is uh, delta A. This is the area under the curve in the interval x and x plus delta x right that we have shown in the diagram this uh, delta a is under the curve under f x and between two values which are x and x plus delta x right that is very clear. Now, these are the some of the important relationships we have to understand that delta a is greater than or equal to delta x multiplied by f x. So, what is this saying? Remember what is delta a? Delta a is this entire slanted shaded region. This is delta a. What is being said here is this area will be greater than delta x multiplied by f x. Okay? That is what uh, which is being claimed. Now, what is delta x multiplied by f x? What is the meaning of this claim? Well, uh, delta x is the base. Okay? This is delta x and what is f x? f x is this height. So, when we are saying delta x multiplied by f x, what we have in mind is this rectangle, the area of this rectangle. Right? This rectangles area is given by delta x multiplied by f x and we have in this example taken an increasing function. So, we are saying that delta a which is the area under the curve right that should be either greater than or equal to the area of this rectangle. 
right if the function is not an increasing function if it's a flat function it's a you know think about a horizontal line in that case uh, these two parts left hand side will be just equal to right hand side but since we are considering a mildly increasing function so uh, we are writing as this as an weak uh, inequality okay this is what this uh, relationship is saying delta a which is the area under the curve in this particular interval is greater than or equal to the area of the uh, rectangle where the height is fx okay and you have another relationship similar relationship i should say which is uh, saying that delta x multiplied by f of x plus delta x is greater than or equal to delta a and this is just similar in the sense that uh, concentrate on the left hand side expression delta x what is delta x again the base of this rectangle and what is f of x plus delta x it is this this is f of x plus delta x this height so when you are writing this expression delta x multiplied by f of x plus delta x what you have in mind is the area of this bigger rectangle right so earlier the rectangle was this rectangle now this one was the smaller rectangle now when you are expressing this you are talking about uh, a small block which has been you know kept above the smaller rectangle and you have a longer rectangle okay and what is being said as is this is greater than or equal to delta a okay and that is obvious what is delta a delta a is area below the function uh, so that is the right hand side but on the left hand side what you have you have the area below the function but you have something extra okay that is why this should be greater than or equal to delta a why equal to well greater than one can understand it is obvious y equal to again the reason has to do with the fact that this fx function could be a horizontal line right if it is a horizontal line you know slope of 0 then you actually have an equality you do not have uh, any inequality you have an equality and that is why to make uh, that possibility felt here we have a greater than equal to sign here. So, these two things uh, are correct both these two things are correct and we can combine these two relationships in a single relationship actually because delta a is common to both of them. Combining uh, these two we get this right just to make sure whether we have done it correctly uh, delta x multiplied by f x plus delta x is greater than or equal to delta a yes that is true here it is coming from here and delta a is greater than or equal to delta x multiplied by f x that is also coming from here. So, both these things are correct therefore, I can write this as a chain uh, this chain is saying that delta x multiplied by f of x plus delta x is greater than or equal to delta a which is greater than or equal to delta x multiplied by f x. Okay. Now, I am going to use the something which I, I have just found out earlier that delta a can be written as this a of x plus delta x minus a of x and this is uh, something we have talked about earlier. I am just going to substitute this in this uh, in this place all right and next we divide all these three expressions by delta x. I can do that 
legitimately be cos delta x is not equal to 0, it is the increment. So, it is not equal to 0. So, I can divide uh, all these 3 terms with delta x and then I shall get this uh, expression f of x plus delta x is greater than or equal to a of x plus delta x minus a x uh, divided by delta x greater than or equal to f x. Now, I take the limit of delta x going to 0 in this entire relationship right in this chain. Now, if I concentrate on the middle portion the second term as delta x goes to 0 what happens to this? Just uh, notice what is this term the middle term this is nothing but the Newton quotient. Okay. And as delta x goes to 0 I know what happens to the Newton quotient it becomes the derivative of this function which function a a of x. So, it becomes a prime of x. So, d d x of a x that is what it becomes the second term okay, that happens to the middle term. On the other hand both the left and the right hand sides approach f x right. This is obvious as delta x goes to 0 uh, this term that is f of x plus delta x will go to f of x and this is the first term whatever the third term the third term is independent of delta x. So, it does not change at all. So, in a sense both the first term and the third term approach uh, f of x whereas, the middle term approaches a prime of x all right that is what happening to the three terms the first term and the third term approach the same uh, value which is f x. And so, assuming the function measuring the area between a and x below f x is a differentiable function okay, that is important. So, I have to assume that a x is a differentiable function otherwise I cannot take the derivative of it. Now, if it is differentiable then the derivative of uh, then this you know this term will become equal to a prime of x that is a dashed of x and that will be equal to f x uh, because f x is what the first term and the last term are uh, converging to approaching as delta x goes to 0. And this will be correct for all x in the interval a to b. Remember just to remind you x is always in this interval it is not greater than b or neither it is less than a. And we have uh, shown and this is a very important result we have shown that as long as x is between a and b uh, and uh, f x is a uh, continuous function then uh, there is this area function which is we are representing by a of x the derivative of that area with respect to any x uh, between a and b that is a prime of x will be equal to the value of the function which is the f x. So, that is the end result of this of this exercise a prime of x is equal to f x what is a prime of x the derivative of the area under the function right under the f x function that derivative of the area is equal to f x. In other words the derivative of the area uh, function that is uh, a x is the area function derivative of this gives the value of the function which is f x. This demonstration that we have just done is not dependent on the assumption of f x being an increasing function. For other kinds of functions a similar argument can be made. So, what is being claimed here is that in this uh, demonstration we have uh, drawn the f x to be an increasing function and then we have shown the, that a dashed of x is equal to f x. Right? Now, the questions uh, 
that can be asked is that suppose fx is not an increasing function then can we claim the same thing can this uh, claim of a dash x is equal to fx be maintained if fx is not an increasing function and uh, the answer to that is actually yes even if fx is not an increasing function uh, it can have other kinds of uh, you know nature in those cases also one can show the same thing the demonstration will be similar if not uh, the same if a x is an area function okay now we are talking about something uh, a little bit complicated suppose a x is an area function let f x be another area function with the property that f dash of x is equal to f x for all x belonging to this interval a to b all right suppose there is another function also f x for which uh, the same relationship holds same relationship holds means remember for a x a dash of x is equal to f x but suppose there is another function f x for which also f that is capital f dash of x is equal to small f of x for all x belonging to a to b now if this is correct so what you are essentially saying is that f dash of x is equal to f x at the same time a dash of x is equal to f x therefore from these two i can conclude that f dash of x is equal to a dash of x now f dash of x is equal to a dash of x that means f x plus c is equal to a of x where c is an arbitrary constant uh, how am i saying this because you take this relationship and you take the derivative of this what do you get this will just become f dash of x because c will uh, become 0 derivative of c is equal to 0 and this is the left hand side on the right hand side also uh, you take the derivative of a x it becomes a prime of x. So, f prime of x is equal to a prime of x uh, from that I can actually write uh, f x plus c is equal to a x. Okay. Now, put small x is equal to a right uh, if you put small x is equal to a then on the right hand side i know what is a of a it is equal to 0 that is how capital a this function has been defined so therefore f of a will be equal to minus c right because you know f of a plus c is equal to 0 therefore f of a will be equal to minus c so f of a is equal to minus c all right and therefore i can write f uh, x minus f of a is equal to a x i have just uh, substituted in case of c i have substituted uh, minus of f a right in this relationship therefore i get capital a of x is equal to f of x minus f of a now what is the implication of this relation a of x is equal to f of x minus f of a what it means is the following to find the area below y is equal to f x between a and b and above x axis find an arbitrary function f x which is continuous in a to b right and such that this relationship is maintained that f dash of x is equal to f of x for all x in a to b so this is the first thing that we found and there if i can find such a function then the required area will be f b minus f a okay that i have just uh, seen here because remember 
f x capital f of x is uh, a function which is such that f dash of x is equal to f x and there is another function a of x which is defined in such a way that a of small a is equal to 0 and using this function and using the relationship uh, this I have found out that a of x is equal to f of x minus f of a and from this I can get what a of b is equal to f of b minus f of a and what is a of uh, b it is nothing but the area that I wanted to find and therefore capital A which is the required area is equal to f of b minus f of a that is what I have written here f of b minus f of a. So, this is the algorithm this is the important thing that we have to remember that if you want to find out the area below a particular function which is given to us continuous function y is equal to f x this function uh, between a and b which are given to us uh, small a's value is given small b's value is given then firstly we find another function capital f x such that capital f dash of x is equal to small f of x for all x in this interval and if I can find such a function capital F x our task is done we have to just evaluate this function at B evaluate this function at A and take the difference that is it ok. So, that is what uh, this interpretation of area under the function is telling us this is called uh, as we shall see this particular uh, F uh, function capital F function will be called the integral. The function capital f x with the property f dash of x is equal to f x is called the anti derivative of f x. Uh, why is it called anti derivative? Well, if you have this capital f dash of x is equal to f x, right, and suppose uh, how did I get capital f dash x? I took d d x of f x right I took f x and take the derivative of that then I got f dash of x and that is equal to the function that we are given which is small f x. So, to get back to capital f x from small f x I have to do something which is opposite to take the derivative right I have to go from here to here. So, to do that I have to uh, reverse the process of uh, differentiation that is why it is called anti derivative of small f x ok. Now, interestingly there can be infinite number of such functions that is f x capital f x which satisfies the property this property there can be infinite number of such functions because think about the constant term capital f x plus c c is the constant term for all these functions you take different values of c you will get different functions from here. Now, for all these c's if you take the derivative then you will get f dash of x right and that f dash of x is equal to small f x. So, I am not sure which capital c is the right capital c. In fact, there are infinite number of capital C's which will satisfy the same condition and all of them are valid and later on we shall see that we can uh, get around this problem by something called an initial value. Okay, an example is given here how to find the area below a function between two uh, particular values find the area below this function which is given to us y is equal to x cube ok. This is given to us below this function and between the point 1 and 2. So, as we know what was the algorithm we have to find another function such that the derivative of that function is equal to x cube and then use that function that is what we have to do 
the derivative of the function that we find should be equal to x cube and you can do some trial and error and you will ultimately find that if you take capital F x is equal to one fourth of x to the power 4 uh, then the derivative of that that is this function will be equal to x cube you can just uh, verify that right uh, so you take the derivative of uh, one fourth of x to the power 4 so you use the power rule it becomes 4 of x cube and that is x cube right so and that is what uh, the function which is given to us. So, this is the function we want to uh, find the anti derivative of x cube and the last task is uh, quite simple I have to evaluate this function at 2 this is f of 2 and from that I have to subtract uh, the value of the function at 1 and that we are doing here that is one fourth of uh, x to the power 4 that is 2 to the power 4 is here minus one fourth of uh, 1 to the power 4 right the values are 2 and 1 and then we simplify this uh, bit and we get 15 divided by 4. So, just to uh, make sure how this looks like. So, here you have the y think about the shape of this function at x is equal to 0 this function will give you a 0 value. So, it passes through the 0 0 point it does pass through the 1 1 point and then it becomes convex function it is always a convex function it becomes steeper and steeper. So, here is your uh, 1 1 and let us suppose this is uh, 2 if you put x is equal to 2 then 2 to the power 3 is uh, 8. So, here is 8 here is 1. So, uh, the area that we are talking about is this area right as you can see it is not an area enclosed by only straight lines on the top you, you have a curve and on the three sides you have straight lines, but fear not we can actually find out the area by this method and it comes out to be 15 divided by 4. Uh, so, what is the approximate value of that this is a little bit less than 4 because had it been 16 divided by 4 it would have been 4. So, it is a value a little bit less than 4, but obviously greater than 3. Okay. Now, the important question that matter that may arise here is that what happens if f x takes negative values. Okay. What does it mean? It means that we are going into the third fourth quadrant. So, you have f x here and here is the fourth quadrant suppose uh, f x uh, takes this kind of shape. So, it goes to the negative territory then uh, does the same formula apply can we use the same method to find out the area right. Now, what will happen if we uh, apply the same method it will give the area as a negative quantity. So, if you want to find out uh, suppose this area between this point and this point this is the area. Now, if you blindly follow the same method as before you are going to get a negative quantity. Now, to correct this what we define the area to be is the negative of what we thought would be the area by our previous formula. So, negative of capital F of B minus capital F of A this is the method that we should apply because if we do not add this negative sign then the area will come out to be negative which is absurd. So, we apply this thing this formula where F x can be negative between A and B. So, here is an example of how we do it in practical terms find the area bit below the x axis uh, and above this function y is equal to x square minus 4 and between 0 and 2 x is equal to 0 and x is equal to 2. So, small a and small b are given f x is given now we have to just find the area. Okay, let us uh, think about uh, this function a bit to see 
how it looks like. Alright, uh, we know at x is equal to 0, what is the value of the function? If you put x is equal to 0, it will give you minus 4. If you put x is equal to 2, it will give you uh, just 2. Uh, 2 square is equal to 4, 4 minus 4 is equal to 0. Okay. So, how does it look like? 0 minus 4 and 2. 2 is somewhere here. Let us suppose 2. And so, this function is going to go through this point and this point. Okay. Uh, how am I sure that it is going to be a convex function? I have drawn a convex function. How do I know that it is a convex function? Well, uh, you just take the second derivative of this function. Second derivative is 2. So, 2 is a positive number. So, it is a convex function. It is a convex function and it passes through these two points 0 minus 4 and 2 0. Uh, so, this basically uh, the main point that I am trying to make is that this basically uh, goes to negative territories. So, I have to apply this uh, formula rather than the formula that we have talked about before. Now, in this new formula or the new method uh, like the old method, I have to first find out f x such that f prime of x is equal to x square minus 4. So, how do I do that? Okay, I assume a particular form, right? f x is equal to let us suppose a of x to the power n minus b of x to the power m. You see, it is a very general form, uh, polynomial form. I do not know the value of a and b m. I have to find those values. What I know is that if I take the derivative of this function, then I will get x square minus 4 which is the given function to us x square minus 4 that I know. Now, from the assumed form which is x uh, to the power n multiplied by a minus b of x to the power m if I take the derivative of that that is f dash of x I will get a n x to the power n minus 1 minus b m x to the power m minus 1 and that I know is equal to x square minus 4. Now, the next task is relatively easy. I just have to compare the coefficients and the powers. Now, if I compare the coefficients, then n minus 1 should be equal to 2, right? This will straight away give me the value of n, n is equal to 4. And I also know that m minus 1 right x to the power m minus 1 here the power of x is 0. So, m minus 1 is equal to uh, 0 x is power 0 is because there is no x here. So, uh, m is equal to 1. So, n and m are found out and using that I can now find out what is b because minus b multiplied by 1 is equal to minus 4. So, b is equal to 4 and a multiplied by 3 is equal to 1 which means a is equal to 1 divided by 3. So, everything is now clear to us. I have found out n, I have found out m, I have found out b, I have found out a. Now, I substitute them back to the assumed form. I will get this function. So, it is one third of x cube minus 4 x and one can actually verify that this will uh, if I take the derivative of this what do I get? It becomes one third multiplied by 3 x square minus 4 that is x square minus 4 and that is what is given as the small f x. So, we are on the right track. Now, the comes the last part which is I have found out capital F x, but since the values are negative the values of f x small f x is negative, then I basically take the negative of f of b minus f of a right minus of f 2 minus f 0. If I multiply uh, by the negative sign, then I get f of 0 minus f of 2. And now, I use this particular form that I have found out and 
if I do so, then I know f of 0 will be equal to 0, this will give me 0. What about f of 2? Well, 1 third of 8 minus 4 multiplied by 2 and that will be what that will be minus of this that is 8 minus 8 by 3 which is equal to 16 divided by 3. So, that is the area. Let us see how if it makes sense or not 16 divided by 3 what is the value of 16 divided by 3 uh, it is a little bit over 5. Okay. Well, look at we are talking about this area. Right. So, what is being said is that the area under this curve uh, is 16 divided by 3. Okay. In a similar vein, if the function alternates between positive and negative values and one wants to find the area enclosed by the curve with the x axis one needs to subdivide the range into smaller intervals. So, suppose the function uh, is such that it uh, snakes around the x axis uh, like this that is it goes to the first quadrant and it can come back to the fourth quadrant etcetera etcetera. Then suppose you want to find the area this this summation of all this right then what do you do suppose we want to find the area bounded by the curve the x axis and the lines a x is equal to a and x is equal to d so here is x is equal to a and here is x is equal to d right you want to find out what is the area enclosed uh, by the function with the x axis that is the area between the function and the x axis and that is the vertical uh, stretch horizontally the stretch it is from a to d. So, the shaded regions that I have demarcated on the diagram uh, those regions uh, the area of those regions have to be found out. Now, here what we do is something quite similar to what we have done before we subdivide the entire range into smaller portions. So, we are basically first finding out those points where the function is intersecting with the x axis here there are two points of intersection b and c. So, between a and b the function is taking a positive value and between c and d also a uh, the function is taking a positive value. So, for those cases uh, we can use the former formula that is you know capital F b minus capital F of a right, but between b and c the function is taking a negative value there we have to take that formula which was applied when the function takes a negative value which is minus of f b minus f a. Right. So, basically what one is saying is that we have to subdivide the entire range according to the points of intersection. All right. And finally, when we have found out this uh, different areas separately then we add up these areas and we are going to get the final result. Okay. So, this is the method. So far, what we have done is that we have not used the word integration or integral, right? We have talked about area under the curve. Right now, we are going to start with this idea of integrals. We are going to use this term. The antiderivative, we have talked about antiderivative. This capital Fx was the antiderivative of small fx. The antiderivative of the function fx has been defined as capital Fx such that capital F dash of x is equal to small fx. Now, this antiderivative is also called the indefinite integral of fx and it is denoted by this sign. So, this is the integration sign, it looks like the letter s 
in English, but sort of elongated S and then you have f x and d x. This is called indefinite integral of f x. Now, remember if this is true, if f dash of x is equal to f x, then there are host of function for all these functions in that group, uh, this will be satisfied because you can just add a constant term that arbitrary constant term will give you different functions, but for all those functions this property will be satisfied. So, due to the presence of a constant term one writes the indefinite integral as follows right this is what one writes integration of f x d x is equal to capital f x plus c. So, capital f x is the antiderivative of small f x, but capital f x is not the function that one is looking at because there could be a plus constant term. So, here is an example. Uh, so, x cube if I take integration of that. So, integration of x cube d x is equal to 1 fourth of x to the power 4 plus c. Why? Because if I take the differentiation of this function on the right hand side, I will get x cube that can be easily verified. You take the derivative of 1 fourth of x to the power 4, what you are going to get is 1 fourth 4 of x cube power rule plus 0 is equal to x cube. So, that is what I was trying to tell that if you have the integration of small f x d x is equal to capital F x, uh, then that basically means that uh, it is uh, there is a constant term there and depending on the value of the constant term you can get different uh, antiderivatives. So, this is uh, in this relationship integration of f x d x is equal to capital F x plus c. Uh, what is the pattern that one is following when one is writing this integration the indefinite integral first comes the integral sign right we have talked about that it looks like uh, an elongated s actually it comes from the uh, letter s s stands for summation then the function f x is occurring small f x and this is called the integrand the function which has to be integrated. So, it is called the integrand and finally, you have uh, the c term on the right hand side which is called the constant of integration right. This is the uh, last term on the right hand side. The d x term has to appear here right after the integral sign is there in order to close this matter the d x has to appear. Uh, what is the importance of this d x term? It appears after the integrand to denote that x is the variable of integration. So, it is the x variable uh, with which the integration is taking place right. It is like the d d x sign. So, in the case of differentiation I use this d d x sign and x why do I write x because with respect to x the differentiation is taking place. Here also the integration uh, when we do it uh, we have to mention with respect to which variable the integration is taking place. So, that is why x is the variable of integration. Well, uh, now uh, before we close uh, I just notice one small formula here which is that if you take any function of the form x to the power n right uh, sort of power is there on the variable and this power is just an arbitrary power n. Then it can be verified if you take the integral and then you are going to get this form x to the power n plus 1 divided by n plus 1 and obviously there is this uh, constant of integration provided that n is not equal to minus 1 because if you know n is equal to minus 1 then the denominator uh, becomes 0 and this term 
becomes undefined. So, we have to uh, be careful that n should not be equal to minus 1 and it can be verified easily if you take the derivative of uh, x to the power n plus 1 divided by n plus 1 plus c. Let us take the derivative of this it will become 1 plus n apply the power rule uh, n plus 0 is equal to x to the power n which is there uh, as the integrand. So, this formula is correct. So, this is like uh, the power rule formula of integration if you take any arbitrary function x to the power n if you want to integrate that if you want to take the indefinite integral of that then you get x to the power n plus 1 divided by n plus 1 plus c c is the constant of integration. Okay, let me stop here I am going to talk about more such rules of integration in the next lecture please join me then thank you.